Cha cha cha. Why can I? I'm going to wave at you. I sent you an invite. Um, or at least I think I did. Jimatatu, if you have an option to, um, I see you waving back. Um, to Rick, wait, here's how I do it. Go live with Jimatatu. Okay. I always forget. Sorry. But now I think I've sent you a request. Yay! Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. How you doing? Um, the, let's do, go to a new question. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> Sorry, that's just like a, a automatic hello thing. Um, let me, let me do my official intro. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Checking In, artists from around the world. My name is Ben Pryor. I'm the senior producer here at Kelly Strayhorn Theater. Um, and we are here with Jumatatu Po, who is an artist and choreographer um, who some of you might know. Um, Jumatatu has worked with Kelly Strayhorn, um, I think, a number of times um, over the years. Um, and I've uh, gotten to work with Jumatatu outside the context of KST in some of the work that I was doing in New York. Um, and um, in some of that work in New York, I got to collaborate with Jumatatu and Joseph Hall together um, on one of our American Realness presentations. And so, um, I don't know, that's, a, that's something that um, I think is nice about um, where we are now um, in my working with Joseph at KST. Um, <laughs> And hopefully getting to work with Jumatatu down the road when that becomes more of a thing that we understand. Uh, <laughs> um, because it's hard. I got to say, it's hard to um, know how to do a lot of things um, in our world right now. Um, yeah. Um, hello to Jamil, who's watching. Hello to Esther, who just joined. Um, Jumatatu, where... Are you right now? I'm in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm in Lenape Hoking, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? I, I think it's, <laughs> I, I want to, you know, the, not to derail your questioning, but I think I need to, I think we need to back up. Or, you know, I, um, you know, we're at the middle of, at the cross section of many pandemics, you know, I mean, the COVID pandemic, the pandemic of racial violence, surrounded by so much death, in the midst of so much death. And I feel like we need to take just a moment to acknowledge that I'm feeling like that whenever, whenever there's a, a conversation. So I just want to, um, I want to, uh, for anybody who's watching, I just want to invite you to into this exercise of warming up the tips of your fingers against the palm of your hand seeing if you can generate some sweat. Let your body generate some moisture. I want to offer a bit of a libation and I can't bear, <laughs> I can't bear to say any more names right now. So you can say them for yourself. Generating some moisture and then with that moisture, letting your finger beds go, letting your, the air touch the water mixed with the earth or the dirt on your fingertips. And just with that, if your hands are clean, because it's still a pandemic, with that, gently approach different parts. I'm using my face because you can see it, of your body, of your other skin. Gently approaching so that your body can sense itself, so that you can feel your life and remind yourself of that in the midst of all this death. And let this be a moment to connect yourself to that life and that death. And then gently ease away, seeing what it means to be super sensitive to that approaching touch, to the whisper of it, to maybe a greater density of it, and then to a release of it, to a contribution of it to a different place. Noticing for yourself how the touch registers differently in different places. I'm hoping, I'm wishing that we have moments to notice our bodies, to notice ourselves, because that in itself 
is an internal process of healing. And healing is itself a lifelong process that I hope we're all invested in. I invite you to continue this for as long as you need to. It can be something that you return to for the, what is this, the seven folks that are watching. I'm going to release it for myself. Yes, I'm in, uh, I'm in Lenape Hoking, I'm Philadelphia. Uh, staying in this place right now that's on the Delaware, Riv the Delaware River, which you can see right here. This is, I, I, I don't live here, I don't own this place. I kind of scanned myself into staying here. I was supposed to be here from November to February. Um, but then, you know, all the cancellations. And so now I'll be here till uh, the end of July. And uh, a couple of days ago, my nephew came to live with me. So he's here too, he's 19. Mm. Super. Thank you for that. Mm. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. I, um, it's been a funky day for me and, and I haven't um, had one of, the, one of our checking in programs um, mm. since we did to our monthly schedule. And so, um, this is, I was actually saying to Joseph this morning, I felt very like, yeah, I don't know how to do this actually, coming mm. into this moment. And um, yeah, like what it, like it's, it just feels like a totally different thing. So I appreciate mm. you um, starting in that place. Um, and um, yeah, it makes me, it makes me, um, I don't know, what else do you feel? Um, not to, not that I want to put pressure on you for the thing, but I want to sort of follow your lead in some ways in terms of um, how we can spend this time and how we can, um, you know, connect and, um, yeah, just um, okay. do what we want with, um, you know, where we are in all mm -hmm. these things, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and not to not to push it in any kind of way, um, you know. I think like the 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 formula is to kind of talk about you know our pre-COVID situation, our post-COVID. Mm -hmm. As you referenced, we're you know, I mean, we've been inside the pandemic of racism for ever, um, and it's um, well. That's the the I I want I want to just say one thing about that. You know, I mean, I think that it's. It might feel like forever, the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of white supremacy, the pandemics of colonialism. There was, there, there's a long human history before that. There will be a long human history after that. And I think that it's important to, to center that within our, you know, within our knowledge and within our imagination too. Sure, thank you. I think that one of the, um, I mean, and it feels like, you know, it feels like the, with, the, uh, with the abolitionist framework, with that kind of, um, with that push toward imagining something that can be intimidating, something that can be scary, something that can be unimaginable, right. to, so to speak, for people. It feels like that is, they're situated in the same place, understanding that these structures did not always exist. They're not permanent. And, um, and, that, we, and that we have and can build and can develop access to shift our perspective, which I think can be important and magical and transformative. And transformation is so essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's that feels like um, one of the bases of where all where everything has to start, right? Is in this in a in a sort of shift of perspective in the self, um, in relationship to. Like what? Like statements that I said, right? Oh no, I don't. Uh, I, you're you, having you sound cut out for a moment. Do you hear me? It's maybe maybe because I was um, the way I was holding the. I'm using an iPad for this, and I had it. Uh, does, is it better now? Yeah, I think it's because you got excited, you got hyped, and then you know, <laughs> <laughs> the phone is muting you. It's the uh, surveillance. 
Uh, yeah, Joseph is saying he can't hear me either, though hopefully... Um, I hear you now. I, yeah. Um, but I appreciate your, your, your call to, um, yeah, to acknowledge the, the shifting of framework and perception inside the self, um, inside of that, um, uh, like what you were saying, yeah, just, just um, right, this, like, white supremacy feels, um, what, extremely oppressive, but it's not... Um, actually uh it's not the only thing it's not it, and, and while it has been for quite some time and most of the time that we know and everything that we've sort of been taught to know is sort of through that there's also a like probably more time um on the earth that um was not actually living under that and and happening under that um and to really go there with um how we're thinking about um the history that we want to tell and acknowledge and think about. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, well, the, yeah, the, the history, I think, yes, absolutely. The history. And I think understanding of that on various levels is crucial. I think that's essential, but, I, but I'm, I, I've been doing this. Um, I've been uh, hosting this conversation series with black and indigenous artists from this place temporarily called the US and that place temporarily called Brazil, uh, in which, I mean, I'm thinking of it as, you know, it's called study sessions, field stories, Monday nights. Yeah, um, you were doing it in Portuguese the other night. It's, uh, so the, <laughs> we have to figure out the marketing. Um, Dia Bui produces the series and yeah, we have to figure out how the marketing so that it's clear that each session is in both English and Portuguese. Ah. So it's, you know, like, yeah, different people were telling me um, that they tuned in and they were like, oh yeah, that, that was cool. You were speaking in Portuguese and then they left because, you know, it's like, they can't understand it, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, both are in both English and Portuguese. Um, and it's, I, I'm thinking of it really as a, as a dreaming laboratory, as an imagination laboratory, because I think that it, I think that imagination is so crucial and especially right, you know, the, the, it's, it's, the cruciality of it is heightened right now. Mm -hmm. It's essential to get us to where we're going from here. But it's, um, but it's hard to do. And I think it's really hard to do when people's, um, when people's needs are at such a high volume. You know, when people's needs are at such a high volume and we're so good at being resourceful, you know, if I can just get this, then I could, you know, then I could just figure it out, all of this, da 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 um, actually, I was doing this like dreaming spiral with my nephew the other night, thinking mm -hmm. about this, just how hard it is to imagine. And particularly, you know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically for black and indigenous folks, you know, like, and I, I wanna, I wanna be a part of all the work that's being done to help us to get, to, to strengthen that imaginative muscle uh, yeah. so that we can, so that it's, so that imagination is not imprisoned by the limit of what we need, you know, that it's not just getting us to, oh, if we could just satisfy these needs, but then, you know, what do we want? And then if we have that, then what do we do from there? How do we get our love? How do we get our learning? How do we get our nourishment? And what does it taste like? What, how do we populate that imagination so fully that we have no choice but to understand that it's real? Mm -hmm. That feels, that feels important and something that I hope that I can commit to fully, rigorously, yeah, in partnership with a whole lot of other people. Yeah, yeah. You're doing so much right now, June Tatu, that feels, that feels um, like built in that direction. Um, you know, I feel like from, um, from obviously the creating new future stuff, which I'd be curious to hear about um, and to share with folks in this context. Mm -hmm. But I think also, um, also, and I think like your statements of transparency on your website and things like that, that, that I feel like you, and, and in working with you, there's a, you've always had a very, um, I feel like transparent and direct approach to um, the kinds of things you're talking about in terms of need and, and want and, and goals 
Um, and it's very uh, inspiring, I find, in terms of, um, uh, like, that takes a lot to, uh, like you're saying, to, to kind of get outside into a space of, like, breaking from the system and saying, no, like, let's imagine this differently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to share any more about any of those things. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, you talked about creating new futures first, so I, I can go there. Creating new futures is a, um, <laughs> I know, what is it? It's like, a, it's, um, well, it's the name, first of all, it's the name of a document. The, whole, the entire name of the document is Creating New Futures, working, working Guidelines Around Ethics and Equity in Presenting Dance and Performance. I'm laughing because I, I'm so, if, if any of y'all are watching, I'm sorry, I always forget the whole title of this thing and I don't have it written down in front of me. Uh, but yeah, but it, I mean, and it came around, it came about at the kind of onset of uh, of COVID-19 and, all, you know, the, the, the public health crises and the beginning of the economic crisis directly related to that. Um, and it, it started off on, specifically, it started off on a, as a conversation on Emily Johnson, a choreographer, and performer, artist, organizer, Emily Johnson, um, who she had just shared a letter that she and her producer, George Lug, had, um, were, were, were trying to get feedback on to send to producers, I mean, to, yes. to presenters who had canceled shows, you know, right. and talking about the kind of, what she felt like was a kind of flippant tone within which those things were canceled, a lack of regard for the amount that this can destabilize. Mm -hmm artists, um, and especially with Emily, who's indigenous, working with indigenous communities, you know. Uh, so, so those specifics, and it started a long thread, and somebody tagged me into it because I had just, I think maybe the week before, released a letter that was kind of similar, you know. Uh, Mariah Weathers, who works with me as a managing producer, we, we wrote a letter together that was directed to some of the presenters who we knew that were canceling shows, and just to talk about the impacts and to make a proposal for cancellation fees, which, mm. you know, already we have been approached with some postponements, which would be the kind of the, uh, the fee that we had originally agreed to postponed to when we, um, when we do the eventual performance. And some presenters had offered, you know, like we can pay 50% of it now, 50% of it later, so on and so on. But the acknowledgement that, you know, for freelance artists, which, the document kind of centers around mm -hmm. already for freelance artists, for freelance workers, for self-employed people, the, the, the social system of that is so unstable. There's yeah. so little protection and yeah. it's a predatory system that's designed to supply labor as cheaply as possible. And, um, and so ask, really we were asking for some collaborators, some collaboration in trying to approach something that was more just. And so the conversations, you know, started around there. We, we, we started talking, Janita Castro was, is the kind of one who spearheaded this the work toward this. Okay. Uh, Janita Castro, who's an who's a, um, artist and organizer who's based in uh, New York, in Brooklyn, I think. And so Janita, you know, started emailing some presenters I originally said that I would help in collecting some of the information that I had seen in articles and people posting online about similar experiences to help to bolster, I think what we were imagining was going to be a piece of writing, a short piece of writing that Janita Castro and Karen Sherman, another choreographer, came together to do. So, so we collected eventually a group of um, the artists, specifically artists who were coming from a dance framework, um, arts managers and producers and arts presenters, a group of 10 of us. And we have a master document that is currently, I think 180 pages, okay. which is we're, we're considering this kind of the, the phase one of this work. Right. The, in a, a little bit into our working, probably about half, maybe about halfway through our writing we were reached out separately. We were reached out to separately from um, Moira Brennan from the MAP Fund and Stanley Brevet from the National Performance Network, 
who were eager to support this work financially. And so they put, you know, about collectively about $20,000 toward it. And once we, once we started getting a sense of what we were doing, that it was dealing with pandemics far beyond just the COVID-19 public health pandemic, um, that we were dealing with the beginnings of something, of being in alignment with other folks that ma are making the case for reparations as it has to do with dance, for, for an abolitionist framework as it has to do with the art world. Um, and for, I mean, you know, in our title, it's called equity, but I think that it's, it feels like more and more we're trying to move towards something that is liberatory, that is just, that is justice centered. And so, it, so, so it's going to take a lot more work. It's going to take a lot more than this kind of focused group of 10 people who I think that it's, you know, I, you know, we talk about this often, the, it's not every group of artists and organizers and presenters or whatever that are on Facebook having a public conversation that's going to gather the, that's going to um, attract the attention of somebody from MAP Fund, somebody from National Performance Network. So we're trying to also leverage that amount of, I don't know, fleeting reputational capital this, you know, like in the moment that we have the attention of these folks and raising money toward the next phase of it. I think right now we're, we have at least 40,000 toward the next phase of this work so that we can kind of recede from these positions of prominence and mm. then populate them with other folks. Hopefully, you know, especially other folks who don't have that kind of reputational capital and who need to be front and center in this conversation and especially black and indigenous folks. So, so that feels like, so that, that's where we are right now with that document. Um, it feels like the phase one was this large kind of excavation process. Phase two has, has, to, has to deal with how we transition these roles in a horizontal, in a, in a way that reflects a kind of horizontal leadership. And it's hard and, you know, we have ideas and we don't, know entirely how that's going to happen mm. i think that i think that one of the things that we're learning is that we we also need to learn from slow mm -hmm. in initially we had this rhythm of rush this rhythm of emergency which felt felt necessary and on some level there's a truth to that and on other levels we're reiterating those rhythms of what you say I said it's capitalism pushing exactly. us again. Exactly. That urgency, that perfectionism, you know, the, all of those things undoubtedly present in this work. So, so now is really the time to transition with grace um, and with accountability. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, yes, that you were talking about transparency earlier, and I do, I'm, the transparency or sharing is super important to me in my life and in also in, in relationship to my work. And I think that it's, I mean, transparency also is something that's super in vogue right now. And I keep trying to have to, I, I keep grounding myself around the question, uh, you know, in service of what? Because mm -hmm. it's, I think that it's, you know, transparency, just like the language of diversity, equity, inclusion, and now, you know, possibly abolition reparations, you know, as soon as they're, the framework of that is understood enough to become co-opted, you know, then those yeah. things can become tools for ma manipulation. So I have yeah. to keep e even checking in with myself, transparency in service of what? Why am I sharing this information? What do I hope that it's going to accomplish? And how am I working toward that in other ways outside of just this, you know, just this like sharing all of my budgets, which are on my webpage, if you'd like to see them. Um, and in addition to that, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of like, I, I provide a, a kind of personal social financial statement from myself that, that talks about how I'm situated in relationship to resource and money um, and privilege or lack of it, you know, all of those things, because I think that all of those are, all of those are essential in deciphering to be able to to be able to contribute to some of this necessary destruction, some of this necessary dismantling.
Yeah. Well, and it's just so much that doesn't get acknowledged or discussed or considered um, in, in, in terms of how people <coughs> like might consume your work or, or the work of any artist or any art project or whatever. You know that there's, there's never really a knowledge or probably very little knowledge about the, like, the conditions and the how of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah, it's, I think it's good. I think it's great stuff that you're doing and, and what that practice is. Um, and super pragmatic to keep it pinned to, like, what are the goals? You know, like, where is this taking us? And what is this trying to do? Where is it trying to bring us? Um, I feel like people aren't necessarily thinking like that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in an organizing family. My first jobs were in activism, you know, and so the I feel like that kind of thinking, which can be useful, is also, you know, part of my DNA framework. Yeah. Um, and it's also, you know, I think it's, it's, it's as useful as it is. You know, I think that sometimes there's a... It feels like a, it feels like a lot of the, the deep organizing activist work that I'm seeing now is really dealing with the importance of reflection, the importance of rest. Mm -hmm. um, which I, yeah, I'm thinking I was watching this uh, yesterday. I was watching, uh, oh, please, if somebody knows, I can't remember her name right now, but it's the, uh, the director of the NAP ministry. But I was watching, she, she had an interview yesterday on Instagram Live. And there's so many. <laughs> oh, there's so much content on Instagram Live right now. Uh, but she was, the, she was talking about, you know, the importance of collective care. And, mm -hmm. and there, you know, and, and how this work, this work is happening in collaboration with so much work around collective care. There's so much important work being done around the collective care right now. And I think... I'm thinking about, you know, how I would love to be part of more circles that are really figuring out how we cycle our cycles of rest and care and work and labor together so that so that I'm so that I'm resting so you can work. So that I'm working so that you can rest. And understanding that, you know, like both of those rhythms, I mean that that slow tempo of reflection and imagination and resting is crucial. And that fast tempo of reflex response, uh, swift response to emergency conditions is crucial. They're both crucial. And the rest is in service of that reflex response that is essential. Sure. And then, you know, and then, the, and then I think that it's important to understand that that essential reflex response, that swiftness, that labor is in service of the rest. You're doing that so that you can rest, so that you can really learn from that rest and do the rejuvenation that you have to do and experience the pleasure, the, the joy in that rest. And that's something that I'm, that's, I mean, that's a part of the reparations work that I'm doing. I'm trying to rest better. Yeah. Hmm. Is that, are, do you feel like you're getting there? I do. Uh, but, but yeah, there was a there was a little kind of something that shot up my spine when you said, "Oh, you're." So at the beginning of the conversation, you said something like, "Oh, you're doing so much," and I was like, "Oh shit!" You know, <laughs> I'm supposed to be moving toward better resting, um, and not that that you know I don't want to. The that's that's a dangerous paradigm to say that you know like doing so much negates resting or resting negates doing doing so much. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, because I I think. I mean, one of the things is here, I'll show you. This is really, oh. <laughs> this is really teaching me right now. Oh, wow. Yes, those socks are purple. And yes, I'm in an orthopedic boot right now, which is teaching me a lot, mm. uh, especially about my own internalized ableisms. Mm. Um, you know, my, my instinct, measuring up my, my, my instinct and desire and disappointment in myself that I'm not, you know, on the streets, um, contributing in person to these protests in that way, uh, measuring that up against this need that I, the, 
this need, this, this, this knowledge, this wisdom that my body has and mm. letting her tell me, you know, like what we need to be doing right now. Right. And also that there are so many different ways to be contributing mm. and that, and that some of them, some of the important ways are on the front lines in those protests in the uprising. And then some of them are in, checking in and seeing how people are eating mm. and then helping to make sure that, you know, people's are on top of their unemployment and navigating that system uh, as close to the legal border as possible so that, you know, it can be benefit them as well as it can. Um, yeah. Knowing that, that, that that's money that they should have been getting anyway. Um, and also, you know, sharing information via social media as much as I can and, um, and contributing to, you know, I did, I, I, I wrote this song the other day that I sent out to some people who I know are organizing events and did a little bit of choreography that I did thinking about how people who, who don't have, um, who don't feel like it's going to be safe for them to be involved in a protest, a traveling protest, because, you know, like, because if you're like, like I do right now, like their bodies won't be taken care of with the people yeah. that are around or they can't move very fast. Like I can't right now, you know? And so thinking about how the choreography can be contributed in various levels so that people can engage with it where they are. Um, that's been, yeah, that, that's been important for me right now and informative yeah. to listen to that. Yeah. Well, and I also feel that, that, that in some kind of way, the work that you're doing with things like creating a new future is, is like a part of this larger reformation of our world and our field that we, that we, you know, are uh, hopefully at the precipice of here in this moment, um, you know, or I don't know it, it, if that feels connected to you in some way, but I think it, it could, um, you know. Yes. I think it does. I think that it's, um, I mean, with creating new futures, it feels important for me to really be centering my and, you know, the rest of the members of the, the first phase working group, our exit strategy, our exit plan, how we can, you know, let our, how, how we can facilitate that transition with grace and ease and respect. Um, mm -hmm. That feels super important right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's unclear who those people are currently, correct? Is there, is there an imagining of? There's an imagining about how, you know, like, I mean, there's different, there's different ways, you know, like, I think that we're, we're trying to pay attention to who's really active in the Facebook group that we have for Creating New Futures right now. Who's really active in um, the Slack channel that we have for Creating New Futures right now, you know, paying attention to those things, but also uh, looking at, at that in relationship to the notion of time poverty, which is a concept from Black Women Temporal Collective. If somebody has the official, I think that's the title, but if somebody can correct me in the comments, please do. Um, which time poverty, you know, I mean, the, the fact that at the onset of the pandemic, the 10 of us, our lives were situated in a way, of course, you know, it's the pandemic. And so it's like right at the beginning, so many things are canceled. Everything is destabilized. A lot of people are in this position of stasis, yeah. just like a lot of people have to go out and go get jobs that are classified essential. We didn't. We didn't have to go out and get jobs that are classified as essential. We could afford to invest this time and this energy and this intellectual labor into something that we felt like would be paying off. We didn't know that we were gonna be supported by MAP and National Performance Network, you know, but even beyond that, knowing that there's going to be some eventual payoff and that we're, you know, that we're doing this work in collaboration with, in service of, you know, a lot of folks that are not at the front and center of it, but that we didn't yet, but again, that we didn't have to go out and run and get a, an essential classified job. And so what about those folks who don't have the time resource right now to invest in that work in this way without knowing how much they're going to be paid so that they can make sure that at the very least their basics are covered. That's important too. And it's, um, and so, you know, like it's, it, 
so we're so we're working on how to how to identify how to identify a group and how to identify a group together collectively so that it's not just the 10 of us identifying a group but how to identify collectively a group that is really going to be able to continue this work in the direction in in the directions that it needs to go yeah um and I'm also, you, like, you know, I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, you go okay. ahead. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, I'm also especially interested, in, you know, this is, there weren't, philanthropy came up a lot in this first edition of the, you know, this first phase of the document. Um, but there were not, there were, there were no uh, people working within philanthropy who contributed to the writing of the document. I think that that is, in, that is a crucial perspective. I think that the, the, the pressure that philanthropic organizations feel to respond to reparations right now is crucial. And, you, and, and I feel, I'm so tired of <laughs> seeing these solidarity statements. I don't even really read them anymore. And if I do, it's really just a quick perusal to see reparation, reparation. Nope, it's not there. Okay, I'm not even messing with it. Mm. Um, to see... To, re to really contend with that, to really contend with that and the, 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 the deep implications of philanthropy and the responsibility of facilitating that mm. in partnership with, you know, government forces, which I feel like people working in phil philanthropy are well uh, equipped to be able to do. Right. But in the meantime, because, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking like meantime strategies are important, how are philanthropic organizations going to step up to provide hazard pay for black and indigenous artists who are working within institutions that are still in their process of decolonizing themselves. Mm -hmm. How are institutions going to step up and organize universal basic income for artists while that's being sorted out in the government? You know, I think that it's, I think that that I think that the need is has long been there. I think that these organiz these philanthropic organizations need to be dismantled, and that can be part of their that process. In instituting plans that will, for right now, serve what the government is not serving, while they get those people on board. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, you know, it's I'm wondering, you know, like what. I, what, I mean, what, for you, Ben, what is your, what is your commitment to reparations? And you know what, don't even answer right now. Let's let this sit for a good minute. Yeah. Even if you already have an answer, let's let this sit for a good minute. I'm gonna be quiet too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to um, to really identify ways that that can feel tangible for me inside inside the um, you know beyond uh, I don't know. I don't know how to um, to like locate that across um, multiple aspects of um, my life, as it were. I, I think you know what I mean in a in a personal, in a professional, in a in a what is that? Um, 
what is that in the light for those things? Um, you broke up there for a minute. I'm sorry, but I don't know if that was the position. Um, I mean, I don't think I was saying anything conclusive in, in any way. Um, you know, it's like, how do we, uh, yeah, Esther, um, Esther is saying, I'm committed to lifting up and centering black indigenous people of color voices. I'm committed to talk to other white people about white people and facilitate anti-racism in my family and my direct community. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, is Esther. That, uh, yeah. You know, and let me, you know, I mean, and, and let, let me say this too, Ben, you know, because I, the, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot right now, which I think is useful, but it's also, um, you know, it's, I think that I don't know is, is a real, you know, it's a real answer. And I also think that it's also the, the, the imperative for us to know is also real right now. So it's like, you know, I mean, I don't know, that's a, I mean, you know, yeah. especially for artists, that's a good starting place. And then where do we go from there? Yeah. Yeah, well, because it's, it's like, what is that? Uh, I don't know. There's so many things where, like, when, what, like, is anything that I could say enough, you know? And or, or that doesn't matter. That's not, the, that's, like, put a value judgment on something. And so how can I, like, you know, remove that from just the act of being able to say, like, yeah, I'm, 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 um, you know, what have I been doing? I feel like I've been trying to um, shift my life and my working practice kind of in, in that direction. Um, I don't know that that's something that I've necessarily articulated in any kind of way, um, personally or professionally, and or that I would like, mm. you know what I mean? Like there's something that, that, that yeah, I, I, I don't know. I feel like I need a space to um, kind of interrogate. So, uh, yeah, I guess I guess I come to this, this this idea of centering or committing to like working with Black and Indigenous artists. Like, is that enough? Is that is that is that a form of reparation? Like, what is that? That like, can that constitute um, that idea, or what does that mean? You know what I mean? Because I feel like there, it it, it sort of feels like there's such a um, the the um, the debt and is like so huge in a sense that like what is anything that I can do to um, to come into that and I guess that's just a that's a um, not a productive place to uh, to be inside of you know what I mean to like to I don't know it's like I think of the smallness of anything I could say to that. Um, but that's not the point, right? It's like, it's, it's that there's, a, there's work towards something. Um, I don't know if any, you know. Yeah, I don't think I'm uh, the... <laughs> am I saying I actually anything think... coherent? What'd you say? I said, am I saying anything coherent? I'm not sure. I'm, you're saying stuff, yes. I think, it's, I think it's coherent in the sense that I understand the words that you're saying. I think that I'm, you know, I don't feel inclined to, I actually don't feel inclined to for, formulate a response right now. Um, sure. But I think that it's, but I think that I want to keep open that, that, that question, that daily meditation, you know, because mm. I feel like that's in, in the same kind of framework that I'm trying to position imagination, imagining, you know, I think that that, I think that that having that daily meditation on, you know, what am I, what am I doing for, for, toward reparations. And I think that, you know, I'll offer that question too, because you were talking about like presenting black and indigenous folks. Is that, a, you know, is that enough? Or I'll ask in service of what? And if, and if you feel mm -hmm. like the, and if you feel like the answer is reparations or one of the answers, you know, then okay. And if you don't, then it's not. And then so then, the, then it's the question again, you know, what is, what is your commitment to reparations? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I get, there's part of me that's also like, what is the definition of reparations in, in, it, you know, in, in terms of like monetary inter right? Like, um, um, I'm trying to think about what, um, yeah, what that, what that can mean and can look like in different, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much research about that, you know, there's so many different proposals that have been done over the past, I don't know how many years. Um, 
and there's and there's new ones in formulation as well, you know. Sure. Yeah, which all of those, you know, I mean, all of those merit merit research, you know, and seeing like what what's the relationship. But also the, I mean, you know, I also. I. I um. <laughs> I trust. What am I about to say? I mean, trust is just, oh God, it's like such a, I've been having these, <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but like these weekly morning dates with um, an artist, Mayfield Brooks, who's, mm. who's wonderful. Um, yes. <laughs> and I love, I love talking to Mayfield, but uh, you know, we, we were talking about trust this past week. And just the, I mean, I'm thinking about trusting body. I'm just thinking about trusting body. So first paying attention to body, paying attention to body and trusting body and paying attention. I mean, you, you, I feel like body can be so informative about, you know, like when you're, when you're telling yourself the truth, when you're bullshitting yourself, I feel like that is, that, that's, you know, paying attention to body is something that is so grounding for me alongside, because it's, you know, because I, because I also think that body can lie, just like people, people lie, alongside, you know, paying attention to and trusting body alongside being within a community of people that can guide you, that you trust to guide you. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, <laughs> I love talking to Mayfield because it's, you know, because uh, I feel like Mayfield will check me in a minute, you know, mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I feel like I'm bullshitting or if, I, if, I, or if I'm trying to, you know, academic my way into some kind of articulation that is really not grounded and that I really don't believe in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's just so, I think it's so crucial to check and be checked, to trust and to be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, I feel like it's in, in thinking about the collaborative work that I do as a choreographer, as a performer, as an organizer, those are the types of community that I want to invest in. This morning I was at a um, dance space project in Hokie. Uh -oh. the, somebody was trying to call me, probably a bill collector, the oh. surveillance, they're always after me. Um, but uh, this morning I was at a, a, the, I was at, you know, the, there was this virtual conversation that was uh, presented by Dance Space Project in Lenape Hoking, Manhattan, in Manhattan, that was um, hosted by Diabui and Orlando Hunter and uh, Angie Pittman. And it was mm -hmm. so beautiful, so beautiful. The work that they're doing, it should be, um, it should be up if you look for here. I'm gonna write out Diabui's name as I talk to you. If you look on okay. Diabui's name, folks, okay. y'all can find out more information about that conversation, and you can also find out how to drop some coins for the uh, for the presenters who graciously shared so much spirit and knowledge. Um, but I, but I, as I was, you know, they were talking about their experience. Dia and Orlando were talking about their experience as co-organizers uh, of um, the facilitation of care for the Black Trans March that happened in New York. Was it on Sunday? I think so. I think it was this past, the, yeah, this past Sunday. And just thinking about like, you know, they, I mean, they, 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 in collaboration with the whole list of other organizers that you can find on DS page, they put that together no collaboration with police or other armed forces that I know of. I just, I'm just thinking about like that trust and trustworthiness as we, you know, as we are on the a precipice of this abolitionist world. And then, you know, and then what's after that, you know, because that's, that's like a, that's like a dream that has been totally contoured. You know, there's so much contouring around that. That's basically, that, that's ready to be implemented. You know, but then, like, then, once, we, we're, once we're there, what's the dream from there? 
you know, that's the that's the type of imagination work that I feel like is so crucial. Like what's beyond that, you know, like we can we can we can articulate this and then okay, so then what? What does that smell like? So anyway, yeah, that 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 trust and trustworthiness, the way that they work together, the way that they support one another, I'm so interested in that right now. I feel like I have been, but it the volume feels turned up right now. And I'm happy for that. Yeah. <laughs> um well I feel like maybe that's a that that could be an ending for us unless there's um more thoughts or things that you um would want to share with folks. Um uh, the You know, I think that it's, you know, I'm just thinking about the NAP Ministries, what I learned from that conversation yesterday, folks. How are you involved in collective care and the collective care that's going on right now in receiving care and in giving care and in, in doing work and doing rest and understanding the ways that those are so tied together? Oh, gosh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's going to take us so much collaborative energy and thought mm -hmm. and heart and rigor to be able to get us to where we're going. So who's, how, how you all doing, how you all doing that? How, how, what's, your, what's, your, what's your organization look like? Who are you collaborating with? Hey love, hey Gerard. Um, well, thank you Dimitatu, thank you for, um your time and your energy and your questions and your work um, and your commitment um, and all the things that you brought to me and to us in this time. Um, I'm very grateful for it. It's been really um, lovely to see you. Um, you and, too. Uh, I'm so sorry about your uh, foot or your leg or whatever's happening don't be, in the boot. Don't be but, sorry for that. Don't be sorry for that. She's teaching me a lot. Good. Um, well, yeah. I'm glad you are there for that learning. And I hope that you um, can keep getting good rest um, and keep coming with the, the questions and actions and propositions to me and the field and all of us. Um, that's really great. And I'm very grateful for it now and um, before and, and um, what, for what's to come. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for talking with me. Yeah, thank you all for, for the folks that, that tuned in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for the comments um, and the contributions as well. Um, okay, well, to be continued um, <laughs> into the future until the next time. Um, feel good Sounds and enjoy good. that sun air. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Take care. Everybody.